Well, we always need God's help. We always need to go before him in prayer. Every Lord's Day, before we do anything here at this church, before I preach, I pray, because we need God to show up, and we need God to, to care for us, direct us, help us, meet us in this wonderful moment where we hear from his word. So would you, would you pray with me? Would you go before the Lord in prayer for his help for the rest of our uh, service here and for this sermon specifically to be able to hear it and to be edified by it? Pray with me, church. Our Father, we are so thankful that you are there for us and that you hear our prayers and your presence is, is always with us. We don't ever doubt that because you're our God and you know us and you know how to meet us where we're at. You know how to care for us. You know how to answer prayer and direct us and, and lead us, Lord. We, we all come here today with a variety of burdens and distractions challenges. Uh, and so we're just desperate for you to, to move even right now to set our hearts and minds on your word so that we might be edified and built up uh, in the preaching of the word uh, today. We're thankful, Lord, uh, for your help. We're desperate for it. We say this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Merry Christmas, First Baptist Church of Gallatin. What a joyous time it is. I, I can't hardly believe that that season's upon us, although in our house we've decorated long before. Uh, but for many of us, we're just um, seeing decorations here at this church. Isn't it great? Look around. Uh, such a, a great job that the team did and helping us out. We're so thankful to see that. It's a wonderful, merry season, isn't it? But I realize... That sometimes this season might not always feel so merry for us all, right? With all the hustle and bustle of the season that's supposed to be joyful, that's supposed to be wonderful, there may be potential difficult things dropping in your life right now or, or that has come into your life during this very moment and those problems, you see, don't ask what time of the year it is, do they? You might be anxious, for instance. I felt anxious of late. I know what that's like. Feel that even now. It's not fun to feel those things. Or you might feel sad about something. You just can't put your finger on. If that's where you're at coming in today, you might not be feeling so joyful and merry. Or you might be a little angry at difficult circumstances. You see, the problems apparently didn't get the memo that we're in this really nice Christmas season, and those aren't supposed to be here right now. They didn't get the memo. And so I get it that some of you, some of us, might not be in a very merry mood this morning at all. And I understand that. That's just life in a fallen world. That's just the reality that we all face at times. And I not only understand this mood that you may be in today might not match this season of love and joy and hope and peace that we find ourselves in. In fact, we're going to be in a series the next four weeks on those specific topics as it relates to Christmas in this Advent series. But I also realize for those of you, this season, all of us, I think, this season carries with it a uniquely kind of nostalgic situation that the holidays bring that we can associate with great excitement and joy or with great sadness and sorrow, depending on your circumstances and life experiences. Like, for those of us who've lost loved ones, this is a hard season without them, the, the, the memories of that. That's hard. I get that. I understand that. And get, God gets that. He understands that. The world, though, I don't think really understands that all that well, or at least they don't know what to do with it. And really, speaking of the world, I read an article, not a Christian article, of course, that suggested that the key to dealing with difficult 
depressing, discouraging, and seemingly hopeless times is to just lose all hope all together. Just throw it out the window. And there you will supposedly find freedom. Because as the article suggested, if you don't have the expectations of things hoped for, then you will be free from its bondage and really be ready to live. I mean, you just don't have any of those expectations or hopes. Well, I think that might be a nice self-help suggestion to those who are hurting for a minute. And I mean like just one minute, like a second maybe. Just, okay, good idea for a second. But once we realize quite quickly how unhelpful it is, we realize that that's a bankrupt situation. It's just impractical for you and for me to try to rid ourselves of expectations of things hoped for. It's unrealistic for us to even suggest that it's even possible for us to do that. For if we don't have anything to hope for, then we don't have anything. And we would cease to exist, to operate in a kind of way that this article suggests for us, because as long as we're living, we are hoping beings. Even if we don't have much hope, it's there, or there's something that's missing that's causing us to be discouraged. To one degree or another, that's there for everyone. Now, we all hope for different things, don't we? We debate um, why we should or shouldn't put our hope in certain things. That's, that's open for debate, right? Our, our bank accounts or our families uh, or our appearances and health or our jobs or our success. We, people can put hope in a lot of different things, but we can't honestly sit here and say that hope, as this article suggested, is something that we just should try to rid ourselves of. Uh, that's just the folly of the world, I hope you can see. The opinions of man. Well, what is hope, I ask, and we should be asking this. The Oxford Dictionary helpfully defines it for us in three ways. I think they're helpful, so let's look at these definitions. It says, first, it says, a person or thing that may help or save someone. And the example that they give, you know, they give examples in the dictionary sometimes. It says, their only hope is surgery, for instance. The second example they give is a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. And the example that they give is, I had high hopes of making the Olympic team. Obviously not about myself, to be clear. Uh, and the third example they give is, Grounds for believing that something good may happen. And the example they give is he does see some hope for the future. Well, ironically enough, the Oxford Dictionary definition here actually aligns quite conveniently with the portion of Scripture that we are going to be looking at together this morning. And for that matter, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. As you see on the screen, we're going to be going all the way to the end of 23 but we're going to be dividing that up uh, in sections as we go. And here we will find in this passage a sure reason for us to hope in the midst of whatever difficulties and things that are going on in our lives today may be happening, or whatever that has gone on in the past that may make it hard for you to hope, or whatever will certainly come in the future, because we can't know what's going on in our future, but but the Lord does, and we can have hope even in midst of that. And I think our passage shows us that. Because Jesus, you see, is our long-awaited and promised Savior. He's what we've all been waiting for. He's what we all need. Even if we don't know it or don't realize it. And his arrival at Christmas reveals many reasons for us to hope as the baby in the manger was preserved and protected for us and for our salvation, as we will see from this passage. And so we're going to see here in point number one, we're going to be called to place our hope in Christmas today. Look with me at chapter one and verses 18 through 24 for this. Now, the birth of Jesus took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they had came together, she was found to be with child 
from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she gave, had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Place your hope in Christmas today. Not the hustle and bustle of the season, but in the newborn Savior King. We see here in this portion of Scripture that we just read, the first of five angelic, providential, God-provided dreams, God sending angels, angels coming to people in dreams. In this short section of Scripture, there will be five of them. And we see here in dream one, or you could mark it in your Bible, I don't know, D1 or something like that, next to verse 20 that we just read about in Joseph's dream. That's the first dream. We're going to see five of them. And we see that the purpose of this dream was to prevent Joseph from leaving his betrothed, his fiance, Mary. God wasn't going to give Joseph an out here, no matter how much Joseph wanted it, because he thought that Mary had been un faithful to him. Why? Because she was pregnant. And he didn't have anything to do with it, right? I mean, he's got good evidence to be concerned, right? That makes sense. He hadn't had any sexual relations with her because they weren't married yet. They were betrothed. They were engaged in this way. But yet she was pregnant. That's a problem. (laughs) That's a big problem. So Joseph wanted out of there. He's thinking, "Uh, I can't go forward with this anymore. But the angel came to Joseph in a dream and reassured him, didn't he? The angel's like, no, 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 no. You got it all wrong, Joseph. She was not unfaithful to you. This baby that is within her is a baby conceived by the Holy Spirit. She's still a virgin. Don't worry. This is a miraculous conception that had nothing to do with Mary being unfaithful to you, but has everything to do with God miraculously causing her to be pregnant with none other than the Savior of the world. So Joseph, from that dream, this providential dream, he changed his ways. He wasn't going to leave her anymore, but he stayed with her. And Mary and Joseph found out there together the nature of this miraculous child of theirs, didn't they? Who, who is this? Who is this boy, this baby? Who is this expected baby? It's none other than the Savior of the world. Look at me at verse 21 again for this. It says in verse 21, she will bear a son, and you will call, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He's the Savior. Mary, at this point, is pregnant with the Savior. This is a miraculous thing, isn't it? Jesus was born, and we celebrate his birth because of who he is and also because of what he would do. What would he do? He came to save his people from the guilt and consequences of their sins. That's Jesus. That's who this baby boy was and is. Now, As it relates to sins, I ask this to you. Do you have painful memories of sins maybe that you've committed that you think about often and discouraged about? You wonder, it causes you doubts. Or maybe really painful, hurting memories about sins that have been committed against you that rob you of your hope. That can do that. Sin in a fallen world, our hope could be robbed because of sins against us because of or sins that we've committed. It causes you, and it can, to be the kind of person because of sin and experiences that we've gone through that just feels just so 
nothing could be positive because everything is just hurting. Everything is just hard. Everything is just going poorly. And there's just nothing to hope for. That's what can happen in this fallen world. Everything is so difficult because it's just you lack hope in the midst of it because of these things. And I'm so sorry if you experience that or if you're experiencing that, that now. I'm sorry as your pastor breaks my heart that you're feeling that way. But I've got good news for you. There was a Savior born to save you from the consequences and guilt of your sin. And also to rescue you from the abuse and mistreatment of others who have sinned against you. It's, it's not like he doesn't know. It's not like he is not there. It's not like he doesn't care. He's the father who cares and knows and is there. He sent his son to rescue you. He's proved it in a big way. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. And if you have this savior, if you're a believer, get this, you have everything. You have everything. There's nothing more than you need. You have a savior from your sins. You you have a rescuer who loves you. You have everything. Think about it. You may not have your dream home or dream home paid in full, or you may not have your favorite car or the ability to go on a luxury vacation whenever you want. And you may be going through relational problems right now, deep ones, difficult situations. And you may be going right now through the most impossible situations that you've ever gone through in your life. And I know some of you who are going through those hard things. But if you're a Christian here with us this morning, you have a Savior who has actually saved you from your sins. You're no longer going to hell in judgment. You've been saved. The child born, who is the child who would grow up to do everything necessary to save you from your sin, he is your only hope. So put your hope in Christmas this morning. That's why he was born. The newborn savior and king. And this leads us to our next point in number two. Number two, increase your hope in the expectation of a savior. Look with me now at Matthew chapter 2 and verses 1 through 12. And it says this, Matthew 2 and verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it was written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold the star that they had seen when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and worshiped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream... Get that? That's dream number two. You could put that number two. Being warned in the dream there in verse 12, not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Increase your hope in the expectation of a Savior. We see here come on the scene these magi or wise men. These wise men were not 
Jewish believers, but Gentiles, who apparently were aware of the Jewish expectation of the Messiah. And they were on mission for this long-awaited king to pay him homage and worship him. That's what we just read about. They were students of the stars, or commonly known as astrologers, and they noticed a star and apparently knew of its significance somehow, likely because maybe the Jews in their hometown may have told them about it, possibly, or maybe they just read the Hebrew Scriptures themselves. I'm not really sure. The text doesn't tell us how they found out about the significance of the star in the sky and the reality of the Savior, but the truth of the matter is God made this revelation to them and they, they made this connection and they were on a mission to follow this star. And they were right about its significance, right? We know the significance of this star. We know the significance of this boy. And in the search of this king, Messiah, these Gentiles, these, these they're not... They're not believers of the one true God in, in the sense uh, of, of Israel. They're not, they're not Jewish in that way. But in their search, they came across another king. Did you, did you notice that? Herod the Great. Herod was a man of great power and capacity. And even also a great track record for unthinkable evil. Especially at the end of his life. And that is exactly where we're at right now in our text since the birth of Jesus coincides with the end of Herod the Great's life. So you see Herod now, after the Magi come and let him know about the star and the king of the Jews, Herod now calls in the big shot scholars and the theologians and the chief priests to have a quick Bible study to kind of pool their resources to find out when and where this Messiah was going to be, where he's coming, and uh, to help these magi on their trip. And the teachers, what do they do? They point out that the scriptures reveal in Micah 5.2 that Bethlehem was the go-to location for, uh, uh, for the magi to set their kind of GPS, ways app, you know, directions to put it on the phone. Bethlehem, that's the spot. Uh, this is where this long-expected ruler, the shepherd king, would come from. So they point them in the right direction to Bethlehem. And then Herod noticed what he's doing. Notice his wicked devices, his evil ways, and his scheming. He, he, he has the wise men scout out the land of Bethlehem themselves. And he wants them to come back uh, for them to let him know where the baby was so that, so that Herod can go also worship worship him. And we know that that's not Herod's right motives. We know that his real intentions that we're going to see in our, our, you know, a little bit later, his real intentions was to do what? To kill Jesus. To take dagger, maybe, and thrust it through that baby boy. That's what Herod's intentions really were. What a deceiving, wicked man he was. We can even learn about Herod more and his track record of evil in the writings in history. And like, for instance, Josephus writes about him and Herod's bloodlust of anyone who was a threat to his throne was well known. Even killing his brother-in-law. He killed his brother-in-law. <laughs> this is an example. His brother-in-law was popular in gaining favor with the people. That was a problem for Herod because that's the kind of guy he was, right? So Herod, what does he do? He staged his brother-in-law's drowning after inviting him to the equivalent of a pool party is basically what the history says. He's there, come on over, and, and he drowns him, makes it look like an accident. Then he covers it up as if it was uh, some, oh, freak accident. He throws a funeral to celebrate him and all these things. What a wicked man Herod was. And that's who we're dealing with here in this passage. This is the same Jesus, sorry, the same Herod who wants Jesus dead. And then we see this moving star, which we don't see ever happening in this way, right? Ever? Ever seen just a, we see a shooting star, right? But just a, a star that's moving, like, 
This, is, this star was literally a pinpoint GPS, Google Maps, direction right to the wise men, straight to the home of Jesus, the very home of Jesus. Not just to Bethlehem as a whole, but right over the house where Jesus was at. This was a miraculous work, providential work of God, you see. And notice that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph are in a home now when the Magi come. They're in a house. They're not in the manger anymore. Jesus is born in a manger. This whole Magi scene was later, after some time had passed, after Jesus' initial birth and the visit of the shepherds that we saw last year on Christmas Day from Luke 2. This is a different scene now at their home. Shepherds are gone. They're at their home. So apparently, a lot of our manger scenes uh, with both the shepherds and the Magi kind of in the manger, a little bit off here when it comes to the actual events. And I'm not going to call you out for those manger scenes. We have one of those in our house as well. Uh, one suggestion would be to have the wise men and, uh, you know, in prior to Christmas, leading up to Christmas, the Magi out leading up to Christmas. Then afterwards, remove the wise men uh, and put the, uh, the, uh, the Magi in, in a home. So you've got to get rid of the, uh, the, uh, um, the manger there. And then, I mean, goodness, this would be a lot of work. Yeah, just, just leave it. Leave it as is. That's what we do as well. Uh, but you just know. You just know uh, the, the details aren't actually all of those things in one. It's kind of combined together. You could, like us, last night we watched a Star Wars movie. You can just use your Jedi uh, mind tricks by looking at it. And so before Christmas, just have the Magi kind of out with the Jedi powers. And afterwards, you know, I don't know. Yes, Linda, you're not, uh, you know... You don't know the Star Wars <laughs> reference, but either way, you see here, time had passed, they're in a home, not in the manger. But back to the wise men. Their anticipation and journey to the Savior was now over as the star planted right above Jesus' house in Bethlehem. That's an amazing thing. And these Gentiles worshiped the baby king that day. They were there for that. Notice that the religious Jewish people were able to show them where he was at, which wasn't actually too far off from where they were at, but they didn't go along with the Magi. They just let the Magi do the work. The Gentiles wanted to worship this baby, but these Jewish people apparently just had no interest at the time for whatever reason. And obviously Herod, we know his reasons. He had these wicked reasons to kill this baby boy. But notice that God would not allow Herod's evil scheme to come about. That's important. The wise men were what? Warned in a dream that we saw, that second dream. Sound familiar, right? We're seeing lots of dreams. We've already seen two out of the five. They're warned in a dream. These wise men stumbled, you see, as it were, over the most cataclysmic, epic, and significant event in person of all of history as they came upon the Savior that day. Just think of it. Do you realize how glorious the Son of God come down to take on human flesh actually is? This is a big deal. This is a big moment. These wise men, they they fall down on the floor, on their faces, and worship this little babe in Bethlehem that day. And they didn't even realize all that you or I know about this Savior, who he was and what he would do, that he would go to the cross to, to die for our sins. They didn't know it all, yet they worshiped him because they knew of his great worth and could do no other that worship him, this, this God babe there in Bethlehem, all they can do is fall down on their faces and worship him because that's how special he was. Do you worship the Savior with that same passion as they did? Knowing all that you know about what he's done for you, does the thought of him and all these things, even in this season, does it... Drop you to your knees, to your face in worship and adoration. Oh, come, let us adore him. Do you adore him? Put yourself in in their shoes here and in the shoes of men and women throughout history who could then only long for and await the blessed Savior in the future since he had not yet come prior to this time. Do you kind of sense that anticipation, the glory of it? that great expectation of something and someone who would change the course of the world, and he would. 
And as we mentioned earlier, maybe you lack something to hope for. And maybe you're trying to find something to hope in. Maybe looking for something to fill that void that's causing you to lack hope, to get you up out of bed in the morning. Then I just say, just look no further than the long-expected Savior Jesus Christ and worship him this very day. Worship him as the Magi worshipped him on that holy day. Worship him now. Let this scene and the reality of the importance of that baby boy Jesus, of Jesus Christ, increase, increase your hope in the expectation of this Savior. Let that encourage you. And this leads us to our last point. And number three, be confident in God's Be confident in the hope of God's undeniable, providential demonstration. We've already seen it. Two wonderful, miraculous dreams kind of leading the way. All these things. Let's consider the last portion here and see more of it in verses 13 through 23. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. You see, that's uh, angel uh, citing number three there in verse 13. And it goes on in verse 14, and he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then he fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentations. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. That's the fourth angel dream there in verse 19. In verse 20, he says, saying, rise, take the child and his mother And go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, fifth dream. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Be confident, church, in the hope of God's undeniable providential demonstration. It doesn't get any clearer than what we're seeing in this portion of Scripture. We have grounds for hope. Not wishful thinking, but actual hope. Connecting with that Oxford Dictionary definition, we have a foundation for hope. We have a future hope. We can anticipate hope. We have something to actually look forward. This is revealed in Scripture. What is that hope, I ask? We've seen it. We know it. Jesus is that hope. Born of a virgin. That's never happened before and will never happen again. Miraculous, right? An angel even sent, get this, an angel even sent as the best premarital counselor that there ever was to keep that family together because they were not staying together until that angel counselor kept them together. Amazing, miraculous. Look what God is doing. Look at his providence. Born in a small town in Bethlehem that you see was also predicted beforehand in the Old Testament scriptures. Prophecy! Said before, and happened, just like the prophets anticipated. Men, these magi, or wise men, seeking to find the the Messiah, 
led by a moving star in the sky. I also don't think that kind of thing has ever happened before, and I don't care how good of astrologers these men were. It wasn't their genius, you see, that led them to Bethlehem that day. We know who led them. The sovereign God, the sovereign providence of God, leading them right there by a moving star. Do you see the providence? Do you see the wonder? Do you see the hope in what God is actually doing? And not even a madman, Herod himself, with all of his intentions to murder, these evil intentions to kill this helpless babe in Bethlehem. Not even a madman could thwart and outwit God. And because of God's great control of things, not even this bad guy could, could mess things up for him. Remember, I have to remind us all, Jesus was just a, a, a baby. Yes, God the Son, take on flesh, fully God and fully human. He was a baby lying there in that home. I've had lots of babies, as you know, and those little ones are helpless, aren't they? They can't take up sword and defend themselves against the bad guys while they're lying in that crib, can they? They can't run away and hide or devise some kind of a plan to figure out uh, their way to kind of uh, coach mom and dad, this is what we need to do. No, like a turn left, turn right, they're coming. That's not what was going on. There, Jesus was a baby lying in, in that home, and, and Herod wants to kill this, this innocent baby, the only truly innocent baby there ever was, because we know Jesus himself was and remained sinless. But Herod wants to take dagger or some other fashion and just kill this baby boy. He wants him dead. But God wouldn't let him. Why? Because God's in control. Even when bad people want to do bad things, God's in control. This reminds me of Psalm chapter 2. Let's actually turn there to Psalm chapter 2 to see this, to see God's plan and in control, even in light of wicked people. Psalm chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4, this is what the word says. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The king of the earth sets themselves and... The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits, talking about God, in the heavens laughs, and the Lord holds them in derision. It's like God was looking down that day as Herod is doing all he could to take out that little baby boy. It's like God was looking down that day on this evil, pathetic man, Herod, and laughing at his attempts to thwart his plans to kill Jesus Christ wasn't going to happen. God was and is in control. God was protecting his son, do you see? And, And though there was great terror, real terror, great sorrow even in what was happening, weeping and wailing, due to Herod's wicked act and slaughtering baby boys in in that place, there was a great hope in the fact that Herod didn't kill his intended target, Jesus Christ. Because this baby was being protected and he fled with his parents to Egypt where he would be safe. Oh, this is, I mean, little baby Jesus was not like, hey, mom mom and dad, we need to go to Egypt. No, God was working with angels and, and his parents and all these providential ways. Real people were wanting to kill Jesus. And he's just a little baby, going to like great lengths, but God protected him. And you see this move to Egypt was also to fulfill scripture that he would be brought back out of Egypt like the people of Israel of old who were also protected, you remember, and brought out of Egypt, if you you know from Exodus. Jesus would be protected and brought out of Egypt once Herod had died and it was later safe for him to leave his hiding place in Egypt, which we saw right in our text, more scripture being fulfilled in Jesus. He comes back to the land, and then he's redirected in another angel dream to the place of his childhood and his upbringing in Nazareth, all to fulfill scripture, even going to Nazareth and being raised in Nazareth was a fulfillment of scripture. You see, all this is pointing to the fact that God was protecting Jesus and doing miraculous things related to him. This is a wonderful, powerful 
thing. It's, we can't miss it. Nazareth, Nazareth was also predicted by the prophets. Not as a specific text directly pointing to Nazareth, but in multiple texts from multiple prophets who predicted a man who would not be acquainted with the pomp and circumstance of most kings in the way that they were. They had all the money, they had all the accolades, they lived in all the great places. No, this king would not be rich and powerful and famous in the way that other kings aspire to be. King Jesus wasn't that way, but he was a humble man, despised and rejected by his people, not of great worldly splendor, but of what? Suffering, lowliness, and an ultimate rejection from his very people, as Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 52 and verse 2 through 3. Look at what is predicted about the way that this suffering servant would be. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. It says what? He, talking about the Messiah, talking about Jesus. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. You see, Nazareth was a fitting place for this humble Messiah to grow up. Why? For we read in the Gospel of John that Nazareth was not the most popular place and happening place for someone to grow up. If you remember in John 1.46, the question is asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's kind of a rhetorical question, sarcastic even. Answer, of course, in that question is no, nothing good. No, no nothing good could come from Nazareth. It's, it's, a, it's a meaningless place. It's nothing special about it. Nothing good could come out of there. No, that's what they were thinking. Nothing good. Just reveals people's estimations of Jesus' hometown in Nazareth. And how, remember, we esteemed him not from Isaiah 53. That's the Messiah. It's the perfect place for someone esteemed not to be born. However, the real answer to the question, of course, is what? It, it, can anything good come out of Nazareth? What do we all know? We know the future, right? The real answer is a resounding yes. Why? Not only something good came, but the best came out of this despised town because the Savior of the world was from there, predicted by the prophets on his way to growing up in his town that, that, that most people ignored, to live a perfect life for us and to die as substitutionary death for us and our salvation, all for his people. Now, all these things being fulfilled, dreams directing, prophecy being fulfilled, the amazing Savior, everything we know, should give us hope. And I realize, though, we talked about this a little bit in, in Sunday school today, that it's easy to lack hope when we lack evidence of things hoped for. And we can lack a foundation to hope in certain things. So, for instance, a man or a woman who may be diagnosed with a terminal a disease or cancer, um, you know, at that point, right, they're, they're not like, having a lot of hope in their health at that point because their health is in question. Or a woman who just lost her seemingly secure job and career by some unexpected company decision can't put much hope in her employers, can she? It's, it's hard to do that in those situations. And parents, for instance, can easily lose hope after they witness maybe uh, their, their children and grown children making terrible life decisions. They have a hard time putting much hope in the decision-making of their children because of the track record, even as they pray for them every day. But I want you to see here in this example of hope from this text. God has given us so much evidence and such a strong foundation of hope, which is illustrated in the protection of his son in this short chapter and a half that we just went through together. Multiple providential dreams. Five that we saw. Multiple fulfillment of prophecy. At least five, if not more, in this short chapter and a half. Things that were said and fulfilled in the Son. And God 
not only giving us all these things, and we recognize that God gives us things, good things, but he gives us a clear foundation in sending his son to us to save us from our sins. We see all this in this short passage. He gives us hope, not only for this life alone, but also future hope in heaven's glory forever and ever. Amen. He gives us so much to hope in. And it's not only illustrated in Jesus as we've just seen, but it's also illustrated in our very lives as well, if we're believers, isn't it? We just got to think back. If we're his children, he cares for us, doesn't he? We may be anxious, and we may be feeling that right now. Maybe you are right now, but you see he clothes the lilies of the field and feeds the sparrow. And how much more does he care for the needs of his children? Jesus said that to us on the Sermon on the Mount. He gives us hope. He gives us help. And we see here in this passage that he did so much for us recorded in Scripture, this short section of Scripture, to furnish us with so much hope for a lifetime of hope. If I gave you an opportunity to have infinite resources to fulfill multiple lifetime dreams as long as you could, I will say this, that kind of a wish from a genie, for instance, would pale in comparison to what God has provided to us in his son. So as you go from here today, as we go from here today on into the season, the remainder of our Christmas season, don't merely go through the motions of it all. Remember that the Savior was sent and born and protected for you and your salvation if you're a Christian. Have hope in that. Reject all other uh, vain attempts in placing your hope in anything other than the sure and firm gospel foundation. Your only true foundational bedrock hope must be Jesus and Jesus alone. There's no other foundation than that. Our only foundation and hope is Christmas. I hope you can see Bethlehem truly is our only sure foundation and hope. And let's pray. Father, we're thankful that you sent your son and that he went willingly, that you protected your son, and that he did everything necessary for us in our salvation. Thank you that we can have hope in Bethlehem, that we can have hope in your son and everything he did. All the wonderful things he did for us gives us hope, even in the midst of times and places where we feel like there is no hope. There's hope in your son, thank you. Help us all to turn our hope, place our hope, and, and help that hope to fuel the rest of this month as we remember the newborn babe who came to save his people from their sins. We say this in Christ's name, amen.